That's right, intro song. All right, bright lights means I can't see most of you. Perfect. And with that, I give you this. Um, thanks everyone for coming. Thank you jQuery for having me here. I am HTML5 app man. Our intern drew that, it's cool. Um, I was having a uh, great conversation yesterday about starting out in computers and QBasic came up. Anybody play QBasic Gorilla? Like three, four people, awesome. <laughs> Just for you, my outline is in basic. All right, so he here's the deal. Basically, um, we're gonna talk, <laughs> basically, we're gonna talk about creating HTML5 mobile apps. And what we specifically will talk about is creating them for offline first. That and hybrid apparently are the buzzwords in 2014 with HTML5 mobile apps. So uh, why? What does the landscape look like? I will not bore you too much with stuff you all probably already know. And then talk about offline. A lot of talk about offline. And the, the thing that I'm presenting really is this Mobile Helix SDK, and I will tell you all about it and show it to you, and then you can get it on GitHub. That clearly is part of the plan. And the three things that we will discuss is how to store data in an offline application easily, how to synchronize it back with the server because nobody expects the app to be offline always. You've got to talk to the server sooner or later, so how do you keep in sync? And then UI components. That's about it. I mean, a little bit on Mobile Helix, but not a big deal. Sound good? Thank you. <laughs> All right. So in 2008, we had the iOS store, Apple store, and uh, Google Play came out, right? And people who write mobile apps are like, cool, I have to write two versions. It's kind of sucky, but you know, it's two versions, no biggie, I will write them. And then in 2009, a couple other stores showed up. All right, well, maybe I don't have to write for all of them, but you know, maybe eventually I will, and oh, look, in 2010, another one, 2011, 2012, 2013, 2014, there's more that were on the list that were sort of less popular, more work in progress -y, but you guys are starting to get the idea. There's kind of a crap ton of, that, that's a technical term, crap ton of uh, app stores. And these are the public ones, so if I wanna download Flappy Birds, now that it's back, I can do that on presumably one of these. Uh, in the enterprise, enterprises are starting to roll their own app stores. So you have a job and you want to distribute some mobile, time and billing application to a thousand people in your organization and now you have each of these individuals with potentially a mobile device and they're going to, which store are they going to? The internal one, the external one? How does that work? Is, it, is the app on both? Because actually a lot of times it is. <laughs> app stores. Um, it, it's getting hard to write a mobile application because you end up writing a whole bunch of mobile applications or playing the which store do I want to target first. Anybody had to do that recently? Anybody even write mobile apps? A couple people. That's all right, it's not just about mobile. It's just the world is getting more <laughs> combined, right? There used to be mobile and desktop, and now they're kind of quasi-merging together, and so many app stores and so little time. So what is the main driver for writing HTML5 mobile apps? Or what is the main driver for pushing HTML5 out there, and specifically in an enterprise setting, but not limited to? Um, a few different things. First of all, there's a lot of app stores. Okay, you know, there's still really only two or three really big ones, a couple growing ones. We could probably deal with that. <sighs> Second thing is the review process. So if you're putting out a game and you have a tweak to it and, you know, it takes Apple a week and a half to review and approve it, eh, you know, could be worse. If you have an enterprise application, uh, you know, pick one that you like, say Dropbox has a new release of their app and it's broken slightly. It's gonna take how long to get that fixed in the app store? Each app store, by the way. Um, Mobile Helix pushed out a release that really was broken one time. And it just happened that Apple was having a big conference. It, it took us like a week and a half to get a fixed version of this app to our customer users. That's not so good. HTML5 is a great alternative because you have an HTML5 app. You want to make changes to it, you make changes to it, right? Dave talked about this. Actually, Dave, Dave, uh, who went to Dave's keynote this morning? 
lots of people. Awesome, good for you. I thought it was great. And I told Dave that I'd be stealing a couple bullet points. Bullet point number one, why do I have to download an app if I just want some functionality? Why can't it just be a website? I'm paraphrasing, but that's kind of the gist of it, right? Um, why would my customers want to download an app? Again, I mean, I'm not saying that HTML5 is the solution to all your problems and you should all write mobile apps in any kind of app in HTML5, but the reality is there is a case to be made for doing it when you have, especially when you have enterprise type applications or applications where customers are depending on it. So again, if something breaks, it would be great to patch it. That's kind of the intro portion of the talk, okay? And so I was thinking about how I would pitch it to you and I just figured I'd take a screenshot of one of my folders. I'm not pitching any of these apps, but the point is this is kind of my, my go-to apps on my phone. And I just started looking down the list. This thing, do I need an app for this? Can I, if, if I had a mobile app, uh, sorry, a mobile HTML5 way of looking at this and it persisted and had an offline capability, would I have downloaded the app? No. WeWork, it's a uh, great uh, co-location place. It's where my office is in Boston. And uh, they have an app. They have a mobile website, too. They're, they're really exactly the same. And now I'm getting alerts from my email and the website and the mobile app. And it's annoying. Uh, eBay, obviously. Facebook uh, on a different list. Uh, there it is. Um, code editor and SSH client. Well, on my computer here, I have those as Chrome apps. So clearly, they could be delivered in HTML5. And you got Amtrak and United. Doesn't matter. The point is. All of these really could be replaced with HTML5 without losing anything. Um, probably Evernote and Messenger and the rest of them too. Games, probably not so much. Anything that involves displaying data, talking to a server and making um, you know, an information exchange available probably could be HTML5. But here's the kicker. So I, I fly United, so I have their app and I'm not complaining about it, but on this trip I had to fly JetBlue and I want a mobile boarding pass. So they send me an email, I click the link, the mobile boarding pass pulls up, it's awesome. I walk up to security, I got my ID and my phone, and I'm like, oh crap, I closed, closed the browser. And now I'm in like a dead zone because I have T-Mobile and I can't get my mobile pass and now I have to get out of line and wait like five minutes and it's uh, not so good, right? <sighs> so I go and download their app because what choice do I have? They don't have an offline capability. And if they did, the only thing I need is the, you know, the pass. And I'm gonna uninstall the app because I'm not flying JetBlue again for a while. Nothing against JetBlue, I actually really like it. But anyway, I uh, had to order at Chipotle. Awesome app, you can go and place your whole order and they, they let you um, track who's ordering what and they push it to their server and I walk into the place 10 minutes later and my order's ready. All I have to do is show them the order, which of course I couldn't do on a website, but if I could then I would have no reason to download the Chipotle app because I don't usually eat there. It's stuff like that, right? Like, why are we making people go and download apps? And you know what, as I said, it's not just about mobile apps. Who here goes on techbargain.com? At least one person. It's great, it, lots of people actually, slowly, once I block the lights out. Um, Tech Bargain is just a listing site for various technology-related deals like laptops and whatnot. Okay, great. The thing is, it takes forever to load that page because they're displaying like 300 deals. And you scroll through it and it takes forever to load it, but guess what, I'm on that like four times a day. So now I'm sitting through four loads where the information really doesn't change too much. I mean, there's a few new deals that pop in, but then there's still like 200 currently loading deals that are reloaded every single time. This concept of offline and HTML5 is by no means limited to a mobile app sitting on my phone, that phone over there, right? It, it, it has an application for desktop sites. It has an application for the new hybrid world that I'm gonna talk about. I mean, that's, that's, it's somewhat universal, and it would be really handy if a lot of these sites started implementing it. All right, well, that's enough of me complaining about what doesn't exist. Let's look at my handy-dandy timeline. First, there were dinosaurs. Then there was HTML5. Then in 2012, everybody kind of realized that HTML5 is not living up to its promise, and everybody was putting out why HTML5 is terrible and don't use it articles which two weeks ago I was searching left, right, and center, but there were too many, so I didn't put them on. A and then in 2014, I'm, now I'm seeing articles because people finally figured out that this thing isn't so bad, and then in the future, we're all gonna live inside a video game called Tron, so life will be better. But uh, 2014 is kind of where we're looking. And so Chris had this 
really nice write-up from 2012, and it was, as the title says, it sort of talks about what's wrong with HTML5 and then sort of gives a bunch of, here's, a, here's promising approaches, technologies, and things that you should all be looking into to actually make it work. But I chose this particular graph because it's kind of where we are, right? It, every, I don't know about you, I remember everybody being super excited and all these little demos coming out and like, look, we implemented this game and it's offline and it's awesome and you can play it. It's like worse than Pac-Man, but it doesn't matter. And then people realize that, you know, no, you cannot put Quake in it. I mean, you could, but you wouldn't want to probably. And then today we're at a point where there's legitimate applications where it makes sense to use it, legitimate reasons why it wouldn't make sense. And we're sort of in that plateau of productivity because well, somewhere between scope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity because finally we're having frameworks and tools and technologies and developer tools that help actually make this thing useful. Anybody asleep yet? I drink so much coffee so I could just stand up and not fall over. Yeah, so 2012, right? And 2014, I, I, I really expected to find all these awesome articles about how HTML5 is great and resurgence and it's awesome and it's gonna really solve your problems and here's how to do it. And yeah, so, no, Jerry's still out and this is another great article by Matt Asse. Um, basically, shifting the whole paradigm. His point is that today, there are lots of HTML5 apps. It is picking up. And the interesting thing to his point here is, so web apps are 23% of whatever, whoever did this study at the end of 2013. And then uh, websites, mobile websites are 38%, so even better. But the rest of this segment, which is actually growing, is all about hybrid. It's, it's PhoneGap, it's Cordova. It's basically saying most of your app is HTML5, and then you wrap it in a nice container because that solves several problems. And then you can distribute it, and life is good. So to me, it looks like 2014 is kind of the year of let's all write HTML5 and then stick it in some sort of container. And I, I found that not entirely strange, but um, I, I try to find the reasons why, and it sort of comes down to this. So a little study on why people don't like to work in HTML5 or what the challenges are. And the top, the top one's performance. I'm not here to argue about the JavaScript rendering performance, but just as an overall user experience of loading up a mobile website, what's that look like? I'm not gonna touch the, the limited access to hardware APIs, although that is a kind of a big concern, and, and Dave touched on that earlier, and basically the standards people are working on it, so that's great. Um, but the other piece that, that almost surprised me until I thought about it um, was UI tools. I don't understand what that has to do with both performance and also with offline storage, and then I'll kind of explain what I figured out. It, it, it actually has a lot to do with it. All right, so that. Um, so why? Well, well, let's back up one more thing. Um, performance. The thing about performance is there's obviously, you know, JavaScript and we can talk about how it's slower than native or faster than native in some cases or whatnot, but that's, that's really not the only thing because we're not talking about an application that never talks to a server that's just sitting there and, and running. We're primarily, or at least I am right now, talking about an application which talks to the server for whatever reason. And so what occurred to me is, well, you know, every time I use my phone and I, I mention to myself or I think to myself, this thing is slow, usually it's a network thing, right? Usually it's not that the app is slow, it's just waiting for something to load. And so performance, it, it turns out it's actually directly tied to being able to store content offline. Because if you had local content, you can eliminate all of those performance bottle gap, um, bottlenecks. So the top reason that people complain about is performance, we kind of have a good solution in offline storage with some caveats that I will get to. And then UI design, like I said, it surprised me at first, but then I realized the UI components are all tied to network and RAM. Like you have a list view in jQuery. What is it operating on? An array, where's the array? In RAM, how much stuff can I shove into that array before my phone browser dies? Not, uh, not 10,000 items, I'll tell you that much. Okay, so we have a solution for that. This is one of the things I would like to present to you in code. I promise I did not just put a bunch of pictures on. There's actually code and demos. And if you were in the room when I was setting up, you almost saw some of it. Um, yeah, so performance and UI are all, to me at least, majorly tied to offline storage capabilities. So then, 
I was looking around for a nice summary of all the different offline storage capabilities, and I ran across this, and it's from 2013, but it's not too bad. You got small stuff like cookies, variables, window, um, dot name. Um, I don't know where to put app cache on that list because app cache is supposed to be sort of a different way to create offline apps, but as Dave said, it makes you want to gouge your eyes out. On the other hand, it's actually potentially very good if you just want to store your JavaScript and HTML and CSS on an offline device. It actually might be great for that. Um, neither here nor there. So you have these, these like variables cookies, but they're very small. You're, again, you're not storing 10,000 table entries in there. Um, then you have WebSQL, and this is by Craig Buckler, and he goes into a little bit of kind of highlighting the pros and cons. Um, probably the biggest disadvantage is marginal browser support and the spec was abandoned in 2010. <sighs> I had a great lunchtime conversation with Oleg about standards and um, not having them and not having stuff implemented in standards. And it, the, the bottom line is we can sit here and complain about standards not being there all day long, but then we won't get any work done. So as engineers, we need solutions that actually work, right? So um, I have one to show you potentially. Um, on the plus side, it's a nice SQL database, and for those browsers that do support it, it actually works pretty well. So I decided to pull up this list of, well, where is it supported? You know what, it's supported basically everywhere except Firefox and IE to a point, and I feel like I need to take a step back and, and sort of explain that my entire SDK that I'm talking about is built on top of WebSQL, and um, it was a decision made a little under two years ago, and the decision was basically we gotta go with something this is well supported for those browsers that are on mobile platforms, namely Apple and Android, so let's go with that. I'm not here to convince you that WebSQL is the way to go by any means. Our next iteration, and we're working on porting this to um, IndexedDB, okay? So the other thing that we wanted to address is this, right? It's SQL database, so you gotta define schemas ahead of time, and then as they change, i.e. when I change my table structure in the back end, then what? It, it becomes kind of a problem. <sighs> so these are the challenges with offline storage, specifically WebSQL. Um, IndexedDB has its own set of challenges, right? Because it's a NoSQL implementation, and it, yes, it's standards-based. I don't know how strongly I would stand up here and say that, but long story short, it's there, it's more modern, it, it, it's great, but it's still just an underlying technology. I, I just talking to somebody on Twitter, ironically, half an hour ago about this. <laughs> it, it, so we have this complaint, you know, no, no standards, the underlying storage mechanism is not standardized, and you got this and you got that. But that's actually just one problem. If somebody came up tomorrow and said, here is the best standard, and it is both SQL and NoSQL, and use either one, and it exists, and it is the one standard to go by, that would be great, but that still wouldn't make it any easier for me as a developer to address stuff like the schemas or the sync or other problems, right? That would be like, you know, 10 years ago when I was programming websites using the LAMP stack and I was writing raw SQL. Well, I don't write raw SQL today. I use some kind of framework. I, hopefully most of you do too, right? So having a phone or a mobile offline storage capability is awesome, but it's still actually only half the uh, solution because then you need to put stuff on top of it to really make it useful, i.e. developer tools, libraries, frameworks, and other things to make it so that as a developer I can just go and use it as opposed to sit there and try to figure out at a very raw level how do I move data between the server and back. <sighs> right, there it is. So um, here's, Kind of the, that was the history and state of where we are, and, and let's talk about where we're going. <sighs> How many of you would agree with the following? A typical application basically does this. I want to log in, go to the network, check the database, make sure I'm authorized, come back and say, yep, you're logged in. All right, now I want to get some conversation threads. Well, let's say it's a chat client. Go to the network, fetch some threads. How many threads? Well, not too many, because you wouldn't want too many, so you need to paginate or you need to return partials. Okay, fine, so I'm gonna chat with Seth. Okay, go pull the, that particular chat thread from the database, return it to my device, get the first text messages, not too many messages. All right, so that comes back. All right, I need to change the sort order. You know, latest message as opposed to or, uh, oldest message. Go to the server, have the server run the operation on the database, come back with a new data set. I, I'm, Anybody want to argue this? 
This is pretty common, right? This is like how these applications are written today, correct? If you have an application, any application, my United application, every time I click on a button, it goes out to the server and it gets whatever, something, not too much something because can't overload the system. So if I were to implement a uh, simple chat client like AIM when they made their first web version of AIM, good times. Um, it, this is the model, right? This is a model that we all live by. If you want to display some stuff, you go to the server and get it. And if you want to resort that stuff, you go to the server and it resorts it. And if you want to search for something, where do you do that? Well, on the server, because you only have a small piece of data. You need to go to the server and search the entire database, potentially, right? So, okay, so, you know, on, <laughs> when I first looked at this, I said, okay, well, you know, it, it's kind of an all or nothing, right? If I have connectivity, this works. If I don't have connectivity, this doesn't work, all right. But it, it's worse than that, because with mobile devices, um, every, every request to the server is not just fetching however many bytes or whatever of information. There's also the overhead of, of spinning up the network, going out to the server, figuring that all out. Um, there's a bunch of data that has nothing to do with me that's being appended on the, the, the query and the return. So basically, if you have a data plan, you're talking about using up more of your data plan. And also, each of these operations has a time penalty as well. So really, this entire you know, concept of me pulling up the app, logging in, pulling up a list of stuff, choosing to either search or reorder it, and then finally getting to the piece of information I want, this is why I'm sitting here going, wow, this thing is really slow. Because I would like to get to that last page load and I really can't because I gotta go through all these steps. And if I'm on a great network, awesome. If I'm on a less than stellar network, but I still have a network, which is pretty common, that's not so pleasant. Yes? Right, right, right. Okay, moving on, moving on. So long story short, what are we trying to do? The thing I'm presenting to you today is trying to change the paradigm. I want to log in for the first time to the server. And upon success, I wanted to get everything it's still within limits, you know, you, you still have limits like a five megabyte local store limit, et cetera, but I would like to get all of that stuff in one go, and then I have an offline application. And so all this, all this boils down to, nope, okay, great, I can just skip through that. That was the four seconds of sound that I really wanted but didn't get, um, so long story short, if you have poor connectivity, if you have no connectivity, you need offline, and that's the crux of what we want. So what, I, what I'm here to talk about is really how to address performance, how to address UI concerns by storing a bunch of stuff offline and then operating on it and all the various interesting things that we have around that. Nobody's leaving and walking out, so people are at least quasi-interested. That's good. Can't see if any of you are asleep, but you know, that's a different problem. <laughs> so the thing I'm really here to present is an open source SDK. And it is um, something that Seth wrote. Uh, Seth was at Stanford in 2000, and he and a couple other colleagues uh, came up with a new way to identify bugs in, sor in source code. It's static analysis technology. They started a company called Coverity. And then Coverity was sold and Seth started a new thing. Uh, and based on this new thing, he, what he really realized is all that time that we went around to customers, I used to work for Seth at Coverity. So all the time we went around to customers, we went to really large shops that had all these internal applications for everything you can imagine, internal order processing, internal directories, internal chat clients, internal everything. There is a lot of them and all of them now are gonna be going mobile. Right? I mean, how many of you are starting to see this at where you work, um, where you can do stuff on mobile? Well, at large companies, it's, it's more interesting because you know, if you work for a startup with 50 or 100 people, then you probably have the latest and greatest. And if you work for you know, Oracle and somebody comes along and says, I want to be, you know, some sales guy says, hey, we all want to access this thing from the back, like a file, you know, securely or whatnot, that's not so easy for Oracle to just go and spin up an app. And so Seth basically, saw that as a challenge, and everything I just talked about is what he looked at and said, okay, the way I'm gonna contribute to fixing this is I'm gonna come up with a way to do these three things. I'm going to change the, I'm gonna create an SDK that you all can use, it's open source, and you can use it to specifically shift the paradigm of an application from, hey, let's go talk to the server every time we need something to this. You know, let's log in, let's fetch 
pretty much everything we want, um, whatever that means, and then after that, everything's offline. So um, getting additional conversation threads. Uh, so I'm talking about a chat client because that's the demo application. So I need to look at different chats, fine. I need to open a chat with someone, but I'm offline, but I'd like to send a couple messages and just have the thing you know, send it to the server when I'm back online, fine. Changing sorting uh, orders or filters or search, all that stuff should operate on local data and thus be much faster, and all of that is offline. So the new paradigm is basically I don't get X messages, I just go get the data, as much data as is reasonable to, to hold on the device, depending on your application. And I don't need to worry about displaying only the first X messages and paging because we have new UI components that are just jQuery mobile widgets that are extended mobile widgets, obviously, that, and, or enhanced, I'm sorry, that will allow us to paginate in a new way. All right, changing the sort order, that will do locally. Filters, searches, we're gonna do all that locally so it'll be really fast. And finally, that whole like next page, next page, we don't need that next page thing. But going back to tech bargains, which is just a really, really long list, how do I get a really, really long list that doesn't take forever to render? Right. So that's our SDK. And our SDK is, um, as I said, open sourced, built on top of jQuery, jQuery Mobile, Web SQL, and Persistence.js, with Persistence.js being the interesting part because Seth ended up rewriting almost the whole thing to basically really abstract away the raw database operations. So having done that, we can now go and port it over to IndexedDB as an underlying layer or some other thing as an underlying layer, which is kind of the next plan going forward. All right, Mobile Helix SDK. Oh, crap. All right, off line storage. Apps, HTML5 apps, never mind, I ruined that bit. It's like a comedian with a broken bit, sorry. But I'm pumped, I will not be here all week. Forget it, fine, here's a, the here's a bottom line. So there's three things that the SDK needs to address in order to give you performance and UI. And that is offline data storage in an easy way, UI UX components, and sync back with the server. Those are the three things that this SDK is all about. Those are the three things that I will be going over in code and samples. In case you can't read my handwriting, I wrote it out for you. You're welcome. <sighs> How does it work? So basically, we want to completely abstract away dealing with SQL. We want to abstract away whatever the underlying storage standard is, because it may not be a standard or it may yet to come. It needs to be high performance, and it needs to be dynamic um, to address the issue of having to come up with schemas up front. We don't want to come up with schemas up front. Uh, and then finally, incremental updates, and that goes back to sync, right? If I have a thousand threads and I want to add one, I shouldn't have to send or receive a thousand and one threads. But it needs to be added to the list automatically, so that's what I'm gonna show you. So this is the Mobile Helix SDK architecture, and specifically the bits that I'm talking about today are the user elements, which is the JavaScript library, and it includes jQuery mobile, uh, you need to include jQuery, and I will show you all the different pieces that we have. It, Seth did this. Anybody use JSF and a Java backend by any chance? Yeah, that's what I thought. Seth was really partial to uh, Java and JSF, uh, and then he told me to write up examples. And I'm like, I'm not touching that. That's no, no one uses that. No one's arguing, see, that's what I'm talking about. So forget Java JSF. The assumption is the back end can be anything you want, all right, and the back end will talk to the client with the usual technology, right, a uh, uh, JSON message is going back and forth. And then, so the three things that we did is, number one, there's this concept of specifying a schema object, which is not the same as going to SQL and creating a database or a, ta or a table layout, really, but that's in essence what it's doing, but it's abstracted away. I will show it to you in a minute. The other thing is sending JSON objects back and forth. What do those objects have to look like? Um, and then finally, the jQuery mobile controls that operate on offline storage as opposed to operate on an array. Those are the kind of three high-level things I'm showing. Make sense? Right. Samsung says it is 240. <clears throat> okay. 
I have a little chat client I wrote. It's not really that impressive. It's just that I can go in there and I can log in and I can see that I have a couple chat threads with Seth and Nick and I can open up the Seth thread and I can scroll and scroll and scroll. There's 200 some odd messages in there and scroll and scroll and scroll. No pagination. Cool. I could put 10,000 elements on there and just keep scrolling. I don't know if you want to scroll through 10,000 elements, but the point is you can do that. Um, search. Oh, all right. Test. I don't know. One. Go. Oh, hey. Two of them. Cool. Uh, 44. Uh, test 44. It's pretty fast, right? Okay. Um, Nick? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, that doesn't apply. Uh, there's no threads because you know why? I'm offline, right? Anybody notice? This thing's offline. So all of those operations I was just showing are all based on offline data. That's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Just say it. You'll, you'll like it. Yay. Um, thank you. Uh, that's it. You've got half an hour. Um, OK, so this is going to be easier to show up. So some message for Nick. Nick's our intern. He drew HTML5 app man. So I will, um, that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was type it in here, right? Some message for Nick. Send. Did that do anything? No. All oh, right, because I still have search. Yeah, this is all me not implementing things correctly. My bad. Go back. Go to Nick. Yay, live demos. All right, maybe not that. Online. Online goes here, has Seth threads. Um, so I keep typing into the search box. This, this is just me and doing a bad UI design. That's my bad. <laughs> That's actually not the SDK. Um, message to send. I believe that gets appended to the very bottom, which is why I wanted to use the Nick thread because it has less stuff in it. I could also search. There it is. See, it has a time signature because it actually went up to the server. Message three. Message three is here. It just doesn't have a timestamp because it didn't go to the server because it's offline, right? But it will when I go back online. That's why the list refreshed. Yes, I have to go all the way to the bottom. That's why the Nick chat thread would have been better, but it's all right. There you go. Um, now it has a timestamp. Yeah, not, it, it, chat client, right? Not that impressive. So let's, let's mosey right along. <sighs> Step number one. I have a server, obviously. I happen to have this. This backend happens to be cake PHP. Um, so the backend is sending a JSON object with a user ID and a username. That's what I have today. How do I get that implemented in offline storage? Well, the Mobile Helix SDK has this concept of a schema, which you define. And the schema has these special fields. Um, the reason these special fields exist is to give it a unique name and then give it a key field and then provide guidance as to which fields are sortable or filterable or globally filterable with diff specific hard-coded options, or finally, um, what the uh, search, uh, which fields should be uh, text indexed for search. The thing is, with our SDK, you don't actually have to manually spell all this out. Basically, what you do is you take your uh, JSON object, the existing JSON object that comes from the server, and you pass it to our prepare schema template function, and you tell it what the table name should be, user, what the key field is to index on, user ID, and then I chose not to have any sorts or filters, and that's it. So if I have an existing application where I'm already receiving JSON objects, I don't really have to go out of my way to do anything. I just pass it to a prepare schema template call, and now I get something that I can, I'll show you why this matters, but basically I have this internal schema, and I kind of talked a lot about addressing schemas up front, but a little bit later you'll see how we dealt with that problem. For now, let's just assume you, you do this up front. So the next thing is, 
to generate the actual table structure in the underlying offline storage mechanism, which again, in this case, happens to be WebSQL. So all I need to do is call general persistence schema. I, I pass it the schema which we created in the previous step. I pass in the table name, which is user, and I get back a callback when it's done. So when it goes, you know, obviously, um, maybe not obviously, what I should point out is the underlying storage mechanism is probably synchronous. And persistence JS with our modifications is where the asynchronous communication comes in. So I don't have to wait for anything. I basically go tell it to create this stuff for me. I'll get a callback when it's done. Obviously, you can pass in a function that does meaningful things beyond calling it, uh, logging it to the console. Make sense? So it's cool. Now it's asynchronous. Now it's happening in the background, and I am not holding up any UI rendering threads or anything, and it goes and does its thing. Awesome. OK, well, now we can put some, some real data in there, like, say, a user who's going to have offline access. So what do I do? Well, we have a synchronized object call. And synchronized object takes a JSON object from the server. And it takes the schema, which we previously created. And then it um, gives you a callback. And that callback is um, telling you that the data was successfully stored in the underlying database. So you, you know, it's asynchronous, which is great. The only downside is you obviously have to wait for that callback before you go and do things like display a field or, I mean, display a list or any other operations, but that's kind of how it all works. But you can do that. So here's an actual real thing from my demo app, which is the user a, uh, object. So I just call parse JSON to create a JavaScript object out of my JSON message, and then I synchronize it with local storage. And in this case, I'm getting back an alert. In the demo app, as you saw after doing this, it basically proceeds to switch to the next page. OK, what about retrieving the offline data? Well, it, the, it, it's pretty simple. And there's a lot of different things you can do. But the really simple case is you can just say load all the objects from persistence. And you supply the schema. So it's not literally loading the entire database. It's basically just loading up that table. And when you receive the object uh, in a callback, uh, you can do things with it. So for example, here I'm saying, get everything out of the users table, and I'm going to take whatever I typed in as my username, and I'm going to create a filter where user is like whatever I passed in, and I'm going to pass it to a new each. Persistence.js has an each function, but it iterates in an array. We're not doing that. So we have a new each, and the new each basically looks like this. There is a start, there is a done, and then there's a each um, in there. So um, I, I could pass in one user record, which is what I'm doing now, or I can load up. I don't know, if you have an enterprise application, maybe you want to load the list of everyone who could possibly log into the app, you can do that. You just get an array of user objects and shove them in here, and then that's it. Either or. So it abstracts away dealing with the database. All you're doing is loading an object. And the schema is sort of the key. Um, so in my implementation, if I have no objects in the data store, that basically means that whoever the user is, they're not going to be able to log in. And if I do have somebody, then they can go ahead and log in. So this is, again, the real one from the, um, the demo application. It's exactly the same. In this case, um, I, I happen to implement the state manager in my app, although I could have actually done that in persistence too. But uh, basically, that's what it's doing, is it's going and getting that. Uh, all right, so here's the fun part. So <laughs> I had a very simple user object. It was just a UID and a username. But now we have a corporate requirement or user requirement or whatever you guys want to imagine where we need to change the underlying schema. Yeah, no problem. We create a new object. We pass it to that same create schema uh, function. And you know how many changes we have to do on the client or in the code? None. The SDK figures it out. The SDK will go into the table, change the table, remap everything, still retain the underlying data. So if you take fields away or add them in, your underlying database will have all that reflected, you do nothing. And you really do nothing, because if you recall from the beginning, the whole point is every time the app talks to the server, the server should send it a single object called a schema that basically says, here's my layout. And so there's nothing really for me to change, because every time the server talks to, I mean, every time the client pulls from the server, it gets whatever the current server database layout looks like. So if I go on the server and add these two fields, then my back end is going to automatically send a modified JSON object. And our SDK will automatically modify the local store without invalidating it. Keyword without invalidating it. And that's kind of cool. 
So we've made it easy, although you do have to sort of define a schema up front, but you're not really manually defining a schema. All you're doing is giving us one sort of representative object from the server with blank fields essentially that says, here's what my layout looks like. And you do that every single time, or, or not every single time, it's up to you, but if you did do it every single time, there would be zero code changes as your backend tables change. And that's pretty cool. Okay, yeah, user object, probably not the most exciting or complicated thing. So let's talk about a chat client implementation. There are threads of me having message conversations with different people, and then there are messages. So there's a single table for messages, and essentially threads has many messages, and a message belongs to a thread. Okay, well, I don't really have to do anything different on the, for, on the client. Um, I create a message schema. So this is, this is a message that I would send from the server, and it looks like this. Message ID, thread ID, message to, from, and the text of the message. And then I would call this, and it would create the appropriate schema with those underscore, underscore, hx, blah, 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 things in there. And then I would create one for threads where inside message, I'm just telling it use the message schema. So there, I, that's it. I just created a uh, has many, many uh, relationship. So uh, where we do this in our commercial product is we have an email client as an HTML5 app, and the email client obviously has lots of relationships with users, with uh, senders and receivers, and the message, and the, the subject line, and all the other stuff, and then calendar and whatnot. So you, you, can, you can lay out really complicated schemes, but you're not really laying them out so much as you ask the server to send a single copy of whatever the biggest object you can get, and then you just give it to our function and it goes and creates the underlying store. There's, there's nothing else you have to do. So, okay, um, next topic of discussion. We have 1,000 messages. I think I have 200-ish in, uh, in the schema there. Um, we have 1,000. So every time I go and fetch from the server, am I pulling 1,000 messages? No, that would be silly. So we have this thing called a delta object. A delta object looks just like a regular object, except it has an HX type of 1001, and then it has adds, deletes, and updates. So, you know, in an email client, if you want an offline email client, and you delete a couple of emails, and then you write a couple of emails, and then you go online, it's really easy. We basically go to the server, figure out what the last sync state was, flag all the items that are new, and then process them as adds, deletes, or updates, I guess. So we have, you, you have this capability to uh, reduce the network traffic in, in like TechBard, and you don't have to reload the whole thing with you know, 300 little deals. You could basically say these 50 should be deleted because they're outdated, these 50 new ones should come in and plug in at the bottom, done. One single server transaction. It's fast. Certainly faster than going and pulling them all over again. So I have this implemented in the chat client. Um, this is what it looks like when I want to basically say, override the existing thread object, but add the underlying messages. Why do I do that? Well, because my modified timestamp on the thread is going to change, right? I received some new messages, so the thread is modified with a new timestamp. So what I'm saying essentially is, take the thread in my offline store that has thread ID whatever, came in from the wire, um, replace the fields with this, but when it comes to the underlying messages, just add the new ones. So now I don't have to send 1,001 messages from the server, the server just sends me one. Same thing for deletes, right? If I deleted some messages or whatever your application is, you can process those. And you know what? The, the coding is really simple. Whether it's a delta object or a new object to store, it's exactly the same. I pass in um, that delta object to the same synchronized object function you saw earlier. And the SDK figures out, oh, this is a change. All right, let me go pull up the appropriate tables, make the, the changes. You guys don't really have to do anything to make that work. And uh, this is a real one of what it looks like um, from the code. In this case, I'm saying basically update the thread um, for the messages. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry, this is a delete. So uh, if you wanted to delete a bunch of messages that the server says have been deleted, maybe by somebody else somewhere else, I can delete them from my local store, and so that's the synchronization idea. A couple people are nodding, this is nice. Finally, we're rolling. All right, let's, let's keep going. Uh, finally, uh, UI. List view? No, this isn't a list view. We, we created this thing called a data list. We actually created a few of these, and there's room for more, so anybody who wants to join a new open source project 
come on down. But a data list is what I showed you with my scrolling messages. It's basically an infinitely scrollable list, which is really just paginating um, under, under the covers. And it has a lot of UI capabilities. So we, we something else Dave mentioned about the whole uh, touch event really resonated. This UI element data list can recognize a left swipe, well, a left swipe, a right swipe, a tap, a tap and hold, and a, um, actually, that, that's it, right? Oh, and pull down to refresh. So that's all part of this widget. All you have to do is create the appropriate uh, callback functions for doing each of those operations. It also implements, if you want to sort, it implements the little pull down for sorting, for filtering, the search box that you saw. All of that stuff is implemented in that way. And basically, the, the list view, fit, I mean, sorry, the data list fits in like a list view. I create a, a div called threads. This is just telling us that we should fill the screen on the device. And then I go in here and I say, I would like to create, on page in it, I would like to create a Helix data list. I don't have any items yet. Um, the condition is the schema, so this is gonna hold threads. And uh, the row render is the interesting part. This is the actual function that will actually render one by one the things that you're rendering. So for me, that meant pretty much, um, it's not on there because it's too long, but my rendering function essentially puts in the little picture on the left and the text on the right and the timestamp. You get the point. That's not that different from a list view. Um, and then finally, when I actually go and pull the objects from the database, uh, when I go and call load all objects, and by the way, we have lots of other loaders for things like load object by key or by, by, by specific table. Um, I just call the um, load all objects, and then I pass, when that's, when that's ready, I pass it to the Helix data list. Uh, the command is refresh list, and then I give it the object, and when you see the list blink and refresh, that's what it's doing. So we made this widget to replace list view. We made uh, kind of a horizontal widget for like a calendar application, for example, and then there's a bunch of other smaller helper ones. Um, when you tap and hold, for example, you can come up with a kind of a pop-up uh, context menu from which you can operate on that particular field that you tap and hold on, as an example. Um, so finally, I'll, I'll do local search. We also have uh, sorts and filters, and the gist of it is to, to get search going, first I have to define which fields I want to index for text, and then I um, initialize the data list with the same schema that I already had earlier plus this one extra field, and again, you can do that on the server side or you can do that on the client side, and it, um, and it goes and indexes those fields. So when I type in the search box, what it's really doing is going to each of those fields and then doing a text search. And then finally, the different actions I described are over here. So tap, tap, hold, swipe left, right, uh, pull down, uh, select, and then the items per page. So the data list is doing pagination. You define how many items before the list refreshes. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff in this SDK, and I invite you all to go to GitHub and play with it. Um, I have. I, I want to finish the demo app a little bit, refine it before I throw it on there, but it will be there. Um, and so finally, some suggestions that you guys might already know this, um, but th these are some of sort of the best practices in, in general in mobile. Um, minimize everything, concatenate, minify. We happen um, to use CSS sprites, but uh, Google's WebKit's good. I, personally, I like that. Um, get everything into a single file. I think that's pretty common. Um, use query parameters to handle versioning. Also works for uh, app cache, solving the uh, app cache problem to some extent. So I think this is, uh, this is that. This, this one is interesting, the uh, minimizing the DOM changes. Um, DOM changes are expensive and slow. So our data list, for example, paginates with the absolute smallest number of DOM changes uh, because it's much faster to hide and show elements than it is to add or delete them. So we actually <clears throat> add a whole bunch of them and then selectively show and hide. So our pagination, if you think about it, is kind of two-dimensional because we have to add a window and then start showing and hiding in that window and then reload another window, if that makes sense. Right, and then all the markup um, is, hand is uh, rendered up front and then you basically just show and hide stuff. Uh, and then memory. So. Uh, you know, as much as this whole presentation is really about processing 10,000 items or what have you, there are certainly underlying uh, restrictions, shall we say, 
on doing so. So a list with lots of items starts to get pretty slow on a phone. Consider the iPhone 4S only had half a gig of RAM. My Note 3 has three gigs of RAM, so that's better, but it's also using more of it, courtesy of uh, KitKat. So basically, be careful what you put in memory. Now, what that meant to us, I was quasi-shocked. I've never played with Persistence JS before, but apparently, by default, it actually keeps a reference to each inserted object. <laughs> so guess what happens when you insert 10,000 objects? You're not inserting 10,000 objects. Um, the other thing is it kind of persistence JS runs by basically selecting everything each and every time, um, which is another problem, and that's why I said that uh, we had to kind of rewrite a lot of it. Yeah, so that's what we got. Um, the SDK is available here on the uh, GitHub, the GitHub, <laughs> the Facebook. The uh, demo chat's kind of a work in progress. Uh, more or less, as you guys saw, but it's good at kind of going through everything I just showed. If you want a hands-on play with this stuff, that's probably what I would recommend. I'll get it posted ASAP. Um, if you have any desire to play with this and want me to help out, I can. That's me. Last but not least, if you want to give anonymous feedback, go right ahead through a third-party mechanism. Questions, comments, thoughts? Complaints. The answer is yes. I spent some time in sales. The answer is always yes. I'm sorry, what was the question? That is an excellent question. Um, we dealt with video and audio, so in a way, I, I imagine we dealt with files. Uh, is the live mic? Oh, okay. And then pass it out. Sorry, the question was around files. I, I can't, well, yes, I can. The next person gets the mic. The question was around files. Did we deal with storing files um, as opposed to the stuff I showed, which is mostly textual data? The, the reality is I've only been looking at this SDK for a little while, which is a couple of weeks, to be honest. So I saw a bunch of stuff around storing and processing and displaying audio and video. So I imagine the answer is yes, but I haven't personally put that into my demo, and until I actually code something, it doesn't exist as far as I'm concerned, sorry. So the answer is uh, yes, I think so. How's that? Uploading files? Like, take a picture with, with your phone or with your yeah. iPad and put it on a mobile app, like a web app, and when you have connected that, upload the file on the physical like your Okay, it's a good question. I don't have a good technical answer, so other than hand waving, no point. Um, hit me up on the uh, email from the previous slide, which I can bring back, and I will look into it, because that's a great question. See, my talk actually has like seven minutes to go, so. There you go. So, um, like, you know, when you install a native app, you go to the app store, you install it, uh, there's, there's this whole uh, um, ecosystem around it, but what's your favorite way of installing slash bookmarking a mobile web app on a phone? Um, I've used something like Add to Home Screen on iOS, and they recently <laughs> added for uh, uh, Android yeah. as well, yeah. but. Is there a, a better way or something you do? Yes. Um, so at the risk of promoting the commercial piece of this, uh, Mobile Helix basically has a secure container sitting on the device and then an app server behind the firewall and all the apps are served up through that. So that's our way. Uh, I brought up PhoneGap earlier and the whole concept of hybrid apps. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind the app stores, then actually going through something like Cordova PhoneGap is probably the best way to go. I too have tried add to home screen, and I saw all of, you know, ready, reading into that guy's thread was basically like, here's a whole bunch of reasons why this isn't perfect and will not be reliable, but sure, use it. Uh, you know, you can do that, 
I didn't know he had an Android port. That's good to know. Thank you. I'll be using that next week. But uh, um, our preferred approach, unfortunately, at this point is, is basically Cordova PhoneGap. It's only once. Oh, fine. I'll walk over. How do you manage what's changed? You said that you only get the changed records. How do you know which records have changed out of the thousand in your example? Ooh, that's a nice question. Let me go up and show the debugger. Sweet. <sighs> so, two things. And it depends on what you mean by what changed. First of all, First of all, can you, can you guys even see what I'm showing on the screen? Because I think it's fairly small, and I don't think I can get the font any bigger on, on this. So we insert a bunch of our own tracking um, UUIDs. So we have our own signature of objects in addition to the schema where you say this is a, a user ID. But to us, it's a user ID that has a unique tag. And so you could use those tags to, to synchronize. Um, so if you're talking about how do I dynamically change the schema, well, it looks like that, right? So if you go and add a, you know, if, you, if you're adding a couple extra fields and taking one away, we'll go in here, but any field that you have, in addition to it, we have our own tracking field, so we can always uniquely identify the objects and then change the underlying, uh, you know, I could take out the uh, message from and add some other thing and it, and it basically works. I, there are limitations, right? If I take out message from and, and then replace it with a brand new key called message from sender, then that's gonna basically, it's not gonna know that it's supposed to take all the message froms and put them in the message from sender. Fine, so that one time it'll have to go to the server and reload everything from scratch. And then after that it'll persist again, right? And then the second thing that I, that I talked about is sort of, the, aside from the implementation, it's this concept of delta objects. And so when I was working on this, you know, I, I had to figure out how in my demo app I could go and load 500 new messages and then show that from the server I'm not pulling all of the messages every time I load the page, I'm just pulling the new 500. That is something that you gotta actually implement on the back end. I chose a, uh, adding a uh, field which is like the ID of the last message that was successfully synchronized and then based on that I decide on the server what to send. You can do signature keys. You have access to our internal keys. You can do it based on date stamps. But yes, for that, you actually potentially make backend changes. Um, if your server today is just sending out everything and you want to take advantage of this, you would probably want to go and create some sort of uh, key-based scheme for deciding what to send or not send. Does that answer your question? Yes, I answered one. All right, I am all out of time. Thank you.